It's This Week in Creationism, episode number 36. This week, we're going to hit a bunch of headlines. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time getting bogged down on one single story, but we're going to hit a whole bunch of different stories to kind of wrap up some things that are happening among creationist uh, organizations over the past week. So the coal gap and a Permian flood boundary, James Webb Space Telescope panic, the horse series, killer whales, Venus fly traps, that and much more coming up. Yep, we're back, and this time I'm not going to do, this isn't a special edition, this isn't uh, uh, focusing on one or two things and di taking a deep dive into it. Uh, this is a smattering, uh, a, a wide uh, breadth of young earth creationists, including taking a look at some organizations that I rarely talk about. Uh, so let's just get right to it. Let's start talking about a couple of these different stories. One thing I'm gonna, one the first thing I'm going to bring up is a YouTube channel. I don't believe I've mentioned this YouTube channel before. I've certainly mentioned Todd Wood multiple times on this week in creationism and talked about him uh, on my YouTube channel at various times in the past. Uh, but I want to bring to your attention Let's Talk Creation. That's the the name of the YouTube channel. And uh, Todd Wood here, along with uh, Paul Garner, who's in England, uh, have teamed up to do this video series. And you can see they're already up to episode number 42. And there, Todd Wood and Paul Garner, generally just the two of them, uh, talk back and forth about things that are happening in creationism, sort of their viewpoints, but also kind of giving the breadth of viewpoints among young earth creationists on hot topics. Um, sometimes they bring in guests and talk to them. Uh, I find uh, Todd Wood, well, I find both Todd Wood and uh, Paul Garner to be quite refreshing. I think that they, they do a, a very good job of representing the various viewpoints among young earth creationists. They're very honest about where young earth creationists just don't have answers, where they need to continue to do work. And that's one of the things they're doing is they're highlighting difficult questions within young earth creationism in order to stimulate uh, from their perspective, to stimulate uh, continued research and thinking in these areas, try to keep people, you know, try to remove the the stale thoughts <laughs> that uh, the 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 historical um, uh, baggage that comes along with some young Earth creationist ideas that. Uh, that even the newer young earth creationists who see that they're wrong are trying, are having difficulty sort of shaking from the older generation. And here in this particular episode, why are horse fossils important to young earth creationists? Um, they discuss the horse series. And, uh, and uh, I had this image over here. This is not from their talk because Todd Wood and Paul Garner are very much in agreement that, they're, that the horse series is a real thing. It's a real phenomena in the fossil record that there are, uh, let me get my pen out here, that there is uh, soon after the flood, and they take the flood boundary to be probably at the end of the Cretaceous, um, which would be equated, the modern equivalent of 65 million years ago in conventional uh, geological um, dating. Uh, and they take it that there was an original horse type that was a small uh, animal uh, that was probably a three-toed uh, animal that then over time adapted and diversified as the post-flood world uh, changed its ecology over time from the original plants to um, you know a lot of grasslands and so forth and these plants had, these horses adapted that including getting uh, different uh, types of teeth because that's one of the things that changes in the horse series is um, the, the the tooth types in the jaw of these horses are shown to change uh, for for the different types of food that they're eating and and so they have written in the past and done analyses including uh, what they what they would call statistical barominology to show that uh, the horses are all one kind, that they all actually are related to each other by common ancestry and therefore don't 
really have a reason to oppose the traditional horse series. And as they rightly say, young earth creationists have uh, often balked at this idea. That's why I'm using this image here. False, right? You know, this this can't be true. This is a evolutionist. This is one of their their favorite stories, right? That uh, there there is a series of horse fossils in, um, in 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 a progressive series in the fossil record that demonstrates that there is common ancestry among all these different things. And and many many young Earth creationists have. Um, as I said before, balked at that idea and just called it outright false and, you know, of the devil, if you believe that. And so it's been very difficult for young earth creationists today uh, to um, sort of go up against this narrative when the average person who follows young earth creationist literature has just been told that this can't be true. And to now hear young earth creationists talk about Oh yeah, there is there is a horse series, and and you know that there was just two uh, equines that uh, got off the ark, and they adapted and changed and evolved into these various. Uh, they speciated into all these different species that we have alive today, and all the different extinct horses um, as well. Which even Todd Wood and and um, and. Um, Paul Garner uh, acknowledged that there's a lot of extinct species and a lot of extinct variation. So their um, YouTube channel is well worth following if you want to get the young earth, a young earth perspective on things and you want to hear young earth creationists talk very openly and candidly about the evidence and you know what how they speculate that uh, they might be able to explain that particular evidence but they are willing to admit where they don't understand things now it's a it's a very different perspective than you would hear from uh, any young earth creationist that say answers in genesis who you know they have the answers book right you just read the chapter there's the answers right everything is presented as an answer rarely is there speculation or admission that uh, there are tough questions that that they don't have answers for right that's their job is to provide answers and that's what they do they provide answers whether they're right or wrong um yeah so Todd Wood, Paul Garner, Let's Talk Creation. For me, that's a, that's a Young Earth Creationist um, video series that, that I don't miss, right, that I always watch. All right, now moving on to another lesser um, Young Earth Creationist, I'm not going to call it an organization, but a, a blog that is uh, sponsored by uh, Is Genesis History, which I want to remind you Is Genesis History is coming out with a a second um, documentary, and I haven't heard recently about the progress of that or whether there's a, a newest update on when that's going to be released to theaters, but uh, they continue to work on that. And um, from their previous documentary, which was very, very, uh, uh, I'll say successful uh, monetarily and within the Young Earth Creationist community, um, they have sponsored this uh, new creation blog. And to, for me, uh, once again, the new creation blog is something that I check on all the time. And I'll read pretty much anything that is posted there because I really enjoy the writers um, who uh, post uh, articles there at the, at the new creation. Uh, and, and, when again, and again, because they are refreshingly uh, straightforward and uh, nice summaries of what young earth creationist views are, um, warts and all. Right. And and so they they there's so much more informative than many other articles I found at Answers in Genesis or ICR or something like that, where there's such a veneer, a, 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 a spin on everything that um, it becomes a, a real slog to get through their articles and actually figure out, well, what do they really mean here? What, you know, there's these cover words and 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 just superfluous information. Many of their articles here just cut to the chase and, and very at, very concisely summarize information. I'm jealous because my writing is very <laughs> overly ver verbose, and uh, I like the fact that, the, that these are short articles that, that tell me a lot. So this particular article, When the Floodwaters Dried Up, uh, is by one of my favorite writers there, and that's Christian Ryan. He's a, a, a geology student, uh, undergraduate student, actually, at a, a university in, I believe it's in Maine. And uh, he's been writing for the New Creation blog for a while. Usually what he does is he is summarizing 
uh, other young earth creationist articles from the literature. So you can think of it as like, here's something from their scientific, you know, scientific literatures. I peer reviewed young earth creationist uh, journal articles and he's taking those articles and he is putting a quick summary and sort of a um, he's putting a an introduction on those articles that puts them in perspective as to why this particular article is important and how it relates to all the different questions within young earth creationists and he's usually dealing with controversial topics and he does a wonderful job of of setting the stage and setting the scene of why this is a an I don't know if it's an important paper, but at least why this paper is relevant to a particular question. Does that so much better than the original authors often do. Uh, so I think of it as, I mean, he's very much uh, has a science writer's uh, mindset uh, to the way he writes. So let me let me tell you what this particular one's about. Um, you know, here, here's the very, the first sentence is, is a critical, important question to young earth creationism. Which layers in the geological record represent Noah's flood? Uh, if you follow my channel, you know that I've done multiple videos on this, uh, this topic uh, in which I've been critical of multiple views of young earth creationism. And the, the gist of it is, I've been critical of the fact that they don't have an answer to this question, and it is an important question. This has proven, and, and here, Christian Ryan, perfectly honest here, right? He says, this has proven to be a very controversial topic in young earth creationism. Um, scholars have proposed several competing models. So there are multiple different models within young earth creationism for how to identify the Noah's flood layers, right? The global flood uh, what layers the global flood laid down versus which ones they didn't, which ones are post-flood. Each one presents evidence for the impact the raging floodwaters had on the earth. But there remains one often overlooked detail among creationists regarding the flood. If our planet once experienced a global flood, surely it also experienced global drying as well. And this worldwide drying phase should have left telltale clues behind. Now, see, once again, I, I started reading this article and I thought, yep, you're right, that this is a controversial topic. I wonder what he's going to have to say about this. And he gets to like the fourth sentence and says, I hadn't thought of that particular perspective, right? I've thought of a lot of things that a global flood would, you should have and should be able to see if there's a global flood. But this idea that, okay, things are aqueous, right? They're in water and then the floodwaters recede there should be in the geological record, all right, evidence of this drying period across the whole face of the earth. That should leave, like he says, that should leave telltale clues behind. And looking for those particular clues might be another way of finding where the flood, post-flood boundary is or where what post-flood rocks are versus flood rocks are, all right? So then he says, Fortunately, young earth researcher Harry Dickens has tackled this angle in a recent research paper published in Origin Research Journal. So again, he's going to look at this paper from this journal that, that I haven't looked at and I don't often look at, admittedly. Um, in it, he provides evidence that drying and increasing arid conditions occurred worldwide at a particular time in earth history. So I was like, okay, that's, that's an intriguing uh, observation. What, what exactly is his observation and how strong is this evidence that there's a worldwide sort of um, synchronous drying period uh, during in Earth's history? And when exactly is this period? Because I'm thinking through my knowledge of Earth history and, and I'm thinking where would this time be in which if I went in the geological column I could see evidence that the world is drying during that time. Okay, so great setup. This is what makes Christian Ryder a Christian uh, Ryan a great writer, a great science writer. Right? He he's he's asking pertinent questions, and he's uh, leading you to like wonder. All right, what's the answer to this question? And I wasn't, um, I wasn't disappointed. Okay, he he comes up with something that I had never thought about before. All right. And I'm not going to read the whole article because I promise this is going to be a smattering today. This is the longest I'm going to spend on any particular article. 
Uh, but I had to talk about this point. So midway through, uh, he gets to the real gist of that particular article by Dickens. We don't talk about the coal, cap, the coal gap. Sorry. As mentioned above, coal is plentiful, plentiful throughout the geological column from the Carboniferous until modern times. Okay, right. There's, there's coal seams um, throughout most of the fossil record. All right, and I've made a big deal about coal seams um, in a number of different articles, but I hadn't thought about this particular perspective. But there's one major exception, the coal gap. While coal deposits made from tritophytes and some mesophytes, mesophytes, semi-aquatic plants, are plentiful in the Permian strata, they are non-existent in the lower Triassic. Coal, coal deposits, I, I'm in trouble talking today. Coal deposits do not regain their former plenteous glory until the upper Triassic. These deposits, however, consist primarily of mesophytic plant material, many of which could thrive in hot and arid climates. Okay, so what he's saying here, all right, what he's saying here is that if you look at the, and he's showing the typical geological column where you have um, the Devonian, Carboniferous, and then here's the Permian Age, and then you get to the... Um, Mesozoic, and in the Mesozoic, that time period is the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. We often call that the age of the reptiles, right? Or that's the time of the dinosaurs. And then you have the, the uh, Mesozoic or Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And I just want to remind you that most young Earth creationists say that this is where the flood boundary is. This is, they say, all this material laid down during the flood. This material on the other side of this is post-flood material. And then there's ICR. Oh, yeah, I'm a little ahead of myself. I have another figure for this. I, I, I want to expand this figure in a moment. Um, oh, I'll just do that here. Sorry. Erase that ink. Let's do that again. I just wanted to make this a little larger so you could see it. I forgot I was going to do this. Devonian Carboniferous Permian. Then you have the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and the Mesozoic. That's the age of the dinosaurs. This is 65 million years right here in conventional dating. This is back here at um, 200 and, oh boy, I can never remember my dates. Uh, as much as I've looked at the geological column, I always get my numbers mixed up. Let's say 250 million years, long time ago. Um, and so here's why I was saying that if you were to draw a line down through here, this is where the uh, most young earth creationists draw a line, or at least answers in Genesis type young earth creationists, which is m most really in terms of the influence, uh, would say that the flood, post flood boundary is right here. ICR, remember, is being a little more radical, and they're saying the post flood boundary is right here. And in some ways, um, this actually demarcates the end of coals, the, the coal, the major coal deposits. And then after the flood boundary, you don't have as many coal deposits. And for them, that's one of their evidences that this is the end of the, the end of the flood because they would say that the flood is what caused these various coal deposits. And it doesn't make sense that there's massive coal deposits after the flood. Um, but he, what are we talking about here with this particular article? We're talking about uh, this, this fellow Dickens who is proposing that there is a coal gap, and that coal gap is in the early Triassic, where there are very few to no coal seams, all right, large plant deposits that are preserved for us. And he's proposing that this is a period of in which the entire globe you can see evidence of a much hotter, drier environment. Uh, and then, as he as I quoted there. He says at the very beginning of the late or in the late Triassic is where you start to see some coal seams reappear. But these are all mesophytic plants, which are which live in hot environments. And so he's proposing that right at the end of the flood, then there's this very hot time uh, period. And so all these coal deposits before that are deposited during the flood. Then you have the end of the flood and then you have this hot period of time and then you have massive growth. And then all of this is post flood. Now. This is just, uh, he's not the only one. He's not the first person to propose that the flood boundary is far, far further down in the fossil record uh, in the geological column than most people do. 
I mean, ans ICR is, is calling Answers in Genesis foolish for saying that all this could have been deposited, right? All of this material from the Cenozoic could be deposited, sometimes 1,000 feet thick worth of material, just in the past 4,000 years since the flood. Uh, imagine what, they're gonna, what they must say about those who believe the entire Mesozoic period is all contained after the flood. Um, nonetheless, oh, oh, so what does that mean? That means all the dinosaurs, right? All the dinosaurs exist after the flood rather than prior to the flood because none of the, none of the dinosaur fossils exist in rocks that are flood rocks, according to Dickens. So this is a very different uh, viewpoint, very, you know, a very different model of the flood. Um, wow. And I don't even really know how to react to that because it's, it just seems so out there. Of course, I think even ICR is way out there in suggesting that there's even this much fossil record, right, that's post-flood just in the last 4,000 years. I think that's completely unreasonable, all right, does not match uh, anything we know about how deposition occurs and f fossilization, all that stuff. Um, but to stretch it all the way back to the end of the Permian, and then I don't know how he explains why the dinosaurs, there are no dinosaur bones in the fossil record, all right, in the flood record, and that all dinosaurs persisted after the flood and were all preserved after the flood. I mean, where does he think these dinosaurs were, you know? Um, I know some. I know many creationists who claim that there are evidences that dinosaurs existed after the flood, but all of them, <laughs> like that's an awful lot of flood record. And we have dinosaur bones in all kinds of places where people have lived. You know, like so. I I don't know. It's just, it's just crazy, right? It's crazy. But I you know Christian Ryan does a very good job of presenting this other model and. Um, he has a point, right? Because how would you fit in this drying period in the middle of a flood? Why should there be evidence right in the middle of a flood where there's, why should there be a gap there where there is no plant fossils or large deposits of plant fossils, right? So that's his logic. As a young earth creationist, he's looking for the boundary and it's like, this looks like a boundary because it fits these particular criteria. Now, it doesn't fit a bunch of other criteria, but here, that's the problem with all young earth creationist models, is that one model explains one piece of data, but creates 10 other problems. So each one of them solves a problem while creating more problems, all right? And uh, here's a figure um, from his paper um, th that I looked up. And in that figure, coal before and after the gap. And the interesting thing about the type of coal, and that's the other part of his evidence, is that prior to this gap, it's lycopods, phenopods, calamides, and so forth. These are all ancient, almost all of them extinct groups. And they formed massive layers of vegetation um, and huge forest, actually, of lycopods. We know we have those preserved, of the entire forest of lycopods. And these cover the whole earth. And so it appears that that's the type of trees that were present pre-flood, and then they were all preserved. And then presumably there was a few other types of trees before the flood, but not many of them, because we don't see any evidence of them in the fossil, uh, fossil record, according to him. And then after the fossil flood, there was entirely di different environmental conditions in Dickens' mind. And that's when you get the Mesozoic and Cenozoic periods, right? The dinosaur of the age of the reptiles and the modern period of mammals. Uh, and at that time, you then get uh, podocarps, ferns, uh, nothofagus, and all these other things. These are all gymnosperms. Plus, of course, you get all your flowering plant. And then that is what coal is made up of afterwards. So he is right in identifying there's a problem for young earth creationists. Why are there two very different types of coal separated by this coal gap? Um, and in a old earth model, you simply have all these other types of plants being present and being the major type of vegetation on the earth. And that's why they're preserved in the various uh, geological column as they're developing. And then eventually you have the origin of gymnosperms and then you have large deposits of gymnosperms and fern type coal. Uh, and then later, it's really only the very latest sort of coal seams that have begun to incorporate a lot of your uh, flowering plants uh, into uh, that coal. And so there's that pattern, and young earth creationists 
I really don't think have an explanation for this pattern. And Dickens is at least, you know, give him credit. He's like recognizes there's a problem and is trying to explain it as a pre-flood, post-flood world type thing. Um, but I'm, I can tell you, there's not going to be a whole lot of other creations that are going to buy this, right? Because they're going to be able to easily identify a hundred other problems, things that, that this particular model um, uh, doesn't explain and that their model can explain. All right, so that's uh, that's the coal gap. Now, I just want to quickly mention that I'm I'm really frustrated, surprised, mm, not surprised actually. I, I think this is par for the course. Uh, sadly, um, the reaction of creationists to the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm seeing one article after another, another like here's ICR down here. James Webb Telescope data challenges for the Big Bang question mark. Answers in Genesis. Evolutionists panic over James Webb telescope picks. Now, I've got a couple links there, and hopefully I'll remember to put them at the bottom of this video, to articles you can read about what about this panic. You know, are evolutionary, and why are they evolutionists? It's really astronomers, right? And, and um, you know, do astronomers and astrophysicists, are they panicked over the telescope pictures from the James Webb telescope? I, I'm not really seeing that evidence. Yes, young Earth creationists um, have picked up, especially Ken Ham, will pick up on a few radical, they really are radical um, um, astronomers who have for decades, right, questioned the Big Bang model. Big Bang model. Um, and it's pretty clear that most of their objections have been overturned or dismissed for many, many years. Uh, and so it's, it's those same people that are pointing to, oh, look at this, you know, more evidence of my particular viewpoint. Um, and when Ken Ham says that astronomers are panicking, um, you know, this is the people he's looking, the fringe players who are saying that other astronomers are panicking, right? And he's just picking up on that language. Uh, rather than actually going to the standard conventional, uh, you know, the, the community of astronomers and looking at what they're writing and how they're actually reacting. It's really interesting reading. And I've, I'm not going to go over these articles, but there's two articles you can read about the history of uh, different challenges to um, and expectations of what we're going to see when we see deeper and deeper into um, the universe. Are they panicked? I don't really see any evidence of any panic. Do they find it fascinating data and um, things that are going to cause us to rethink portions of various astronomic models? Certainly, but that's true for every single picture we take and everything we do, constantly adjusting models. Um, is it go deep to the core of Big Bang, sort of the major Big Bang theory? Uh, and does it disrupt all the other evidences that have been um, gathered that support the Big Bang? It doesn't appear so uh, at this point. Maybe it will someday. But I don't see panic you know, among them. This is just hype from young Earth creationists. This is something where they're just... Uh, they're preying on the fact that their audience has clueless about the data, right? And that they can uh, say what, you know, in their words, they'll say what evolutionists and Big Bangist, Big Bangist, just made up a word there, Big Bang theorist um, are predicting and saying. And then they're coming up with their own, like, what their expectations should be. Uh, anyway, I said I wouldn't, I said I wouldn't go too far into this. Just read the articles. You're going to say it so much better than me. Let's move on. <laughs> um, Institute for Creation Research. Uh, completely fixated on their idea of um, continuous environmental tracking and uh, how life is like engineering principles. Uh, and so what better than to look at like the Venus flytrap, right? The Venus flytrap is a plant. Right, a bog plant that uh, can capture insects and uh, melt them down, right? They dissolve them with uh, digestive fluids and then extract nutrients uh, from them. They're not 
eating them in the sense of getting uh, energetic molecules, biomolecules for energy. Uh, they're getting nutrients from like nitrogen and so forth and phosphorus. Um, but uh, look at the article highlights here. Its trap mechanism is specifically engineered to sense motion and only close on living creatures, which it then digests. The Venus flytrap demonstrates the creator's, the creator's purpose, plan, and design. And then down here in the bottom, the, the 2020 article describes how fascinating plant senses, how, how this fascinating plant senses its prey and rapidly responds. Um, look, keep, I'm going to keep this really brief. I found this article interesting for really only one reason. It's clear that the author, Sherwin, is saying that this thing is so intricate, so intricately designed, the Venus flytrap, uh, and it's such a marvel of design uh, that, of course, it had to have a designer, and it had to be made this way, and isn't this amazing that uh, the Venus flytrap demonstrates the creator's purpose, the creator's plan, the creator's design? Well, that all sounds great until you ask the question, well, what was the plan and design for? If it's so intricate, so irreducibly complex, it had to be created the way it is. That means in the original creation, you had an organism whose complete, whose design is designing to kill, right? It's designing to trap and destroy and kill and dissolve another living being, right? In this case, the living being being a fly. And so causes death. Now we're told every single day by young earth creationists that they were, the original world was perfect, right? It included no death of any sort. Now, those are the words you would hear if you read their general literature, and that's what you'd hear if you went to a conference, right? There's no death. If you dig a little farther, you'll, you'll understand that death is qualified, right? No death of things that are nefesh living, you know, the, the Hebrew word nefesh, that is, has the breath of life. And so it's only certain organisms that are biblically defined as being living. And therefore, their then inference is those are the only things that didn't die, all right, before in the perfect world. Because other things that died weren't necessarily ever alive, right? And, and one of the things that they, some of them will claim is that insects, uh, insects aren't truly alive. They don't really have the breath of life. In them, And so they're organic molecules that function in certain ways and aren't really that different from rocks, all right, and streams. And they're, they're animate, but they're not living. And so I think this would be, if I pushed them on this, like, okay, so Venus flytrap, designed to kill. I think that they would say, it's not designed to kill, it's designed to trap other matter for their survival and this is just a this is just how the world recycles material and it's always been that way that's the way god created and that's god created a world in which you know everything had to be recycled and this is how it's recycled um and that this isn't death right this isn't death they're not killing um i you just why <laughs> Again, mixed messages to the average young earth creationist who may not realize that they have a, I don't even want to call it sophisticated, we'll call it a, um, an ad hoc get out of jail free card explanation for why a bunch of different creatures died and, and the perfect world was made so that it was perfectly sculpted for this reorganization of living matter for it to recycle itself over and over and over again, including animals. But at the same time, at a certain point, there are some animals, and I'm not sure exactly where the break point is, right? Maybe fish, but maybe even fish were allowed to die in the original creation. And then maybe only land animals uh, are the ones that were unable to die. Um, and then you could get into the whole like, well, what really makes them different than flies, right? biologically like i can't say that they're they're all that different 
uh, in terms of how they function genetically and all these different things, right? All right, so that's the type of stuff I pick up on when I read articles like this. Now, of course, the, the author here is really only thinking about one thing. I mean, they're not even attempting to explain this whole thing about flies aren't, aren't, uh, aren't living things, right? They're so focused on the design aspect and just how, uh, how incredibly um, intricate this thing is. And so they're, they're only trying to make a point about design and how this system couldn't have evolved. Uh, moving on to answers in Genesis. Killer whales. Killer whales obeying God's command to fill the earth. So God, at creation, in, uh, uh, in the original creation, filled the world, right? Created creatures on the different days and commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. And so all organisms are, are obeying the command of God by filling the world um, through uh, reproduction. And uh, so all organisms are, are somehow trying to fill this mandate that God has given them. And maybe imperfectly because in, for young earth creationists, because of the way they view the fall and organisms are unable to do what they originally were capable of doing, uh, but they still have this mandate, just like man is, has has certain mandates, uh, that are things that are required of him, even even despite uh, his falling into sin. So the mandate is to fill the world. So therefore, if we look at a killer whale and we see that there's a lot of killer whales, well, they're obviously doing a pretty good job of it, right? Yeah, they, they're fulfilling their mandate. There's a lot of killer whales. There's a lot of orcas. Um, now, how does he do it? They're obeying God's command to fill the earth. How do they do it? Well, they do it because they're killer communicators. Dr. Joe Francis, who this was published a while back, but it was recently published again on the Answers in Genesis uh, front page, so that's where I saw it again. They're killer communicators. That's how they fill the world. What makes orcas so successful at filling the oceans? If you think it's their size and strength, well, listen up. Yeah, that's a catch. That's a play on words. Listen up. It's because they talk to each other. They communicate with each other. And it's because of their sophisticated communication that they're able to uh, be successful in the ocean because they're able to help each other round up food. And more food means more offspring, which means they fill the world. Um, great. This whole, you know, they communicate. It was taken a little bit, um, a little bit farther than that. And that's the only reason I'm bringing this article up. Uh, but I will hit one other highlight here. Working together, Genesis 1 teaches that all animals originally ate plant material. But after the fall, many creatures began eating each other. The type of food consumed by orcas varies, and their food choice varies based on convenience. This is a weird, weird paragraph um, because he never addresses anything about their diet after this. It's sort of like, he mentioned some things about orcas at the beginning, and obviously everybody knows orcas are killer whales. And what are they killing? <laughs> Seals, you know, other whales, you know. So they're they're um, they're carnivores, right? So it's almost as if this author felt obligated to like, oh yeah, right. Um, remember, we believe that uh, uh, in the original creation, animals did not eat other animals. Right. So in the original creation, they had to eat plant material now. But wait a sec. These are orcas um, that have teeth and they live in the ocean. I, he, he's not going to explain this at all. Like, what did they eat then? I mean, I guess plankton and algae, or, you know, maybe seaweed. All right. Um, which technically isn't a plant, according to modern taxonomy. But, you know, um, so he, they ate plant material and then just like this, just like. Oh, well, of course, they originally ate plants, but, you know, now they eat animals. But now let's go on and talk about why they're really successful. I mean, not that they're really successful at eating meat, right? It's, it's almost like they're trying to apologize for them eating meat uh, by talking about other ways that they're successful. All right, a little bit farther down. God is a God of relationships. The orca's strong family structure, all right, so they're talking about how they, they, come, they live in pods, groups together. 
rather than their killer instinct is behind their success. Now, I don't, he doesn't have any reference to like what scientific evidence is there that their killer instinct is not what's behind their success. I, I'll grant that their pod family organization is a, a big benefit to them and is a big part of their success, just like it is for dolphins, right? Dolphins are, uh, are amazing at communication and working together to, to track down food. But what I find curious is, is what, where he goes next. This is no surprise. It's not surprising that their family structure is what's successful because look what the Bible says about the creator. God made family the foundation of the human society. And he designed many animal societies that way as well. Well, this article is, it's off the rails, right? It's, it's, um, it's wild speculation that because God made and commanded man and woman to have families, to have procreate and have children, and obviously throughout the text is, is, um, is advocating for certain, um, communal structure, right? Family structure. Because that's the way God operates, that somehow he made his animals that way too, as if animals have to live in similar types of societies. Now, the observation is, is that there are many animals that do, right? And, and I know what he's probably thinking, Francis and other uh, young earth creationists are often thinking. They're thinking, the evolutionary biologist often comes along and says, look at all these other family groups, these other types of mammals especially, and these mammals that, uh, that are organized into and have strong family bonds, right? Like monogamous relationships, and they take care of their young, and they, they teach their young things, and, and so forth, right? And uh, they'll say that that's uh, you know, evidence for why man does that too, because of their, their relationship with other animals, right? So they look at nature and try to apply it to man. This is like the flip side. This is like saying, um, since God created all the animals, he created man, created man with family structure and created man to be communicative, right? Communicates with God. Well, then that's, God, that's the nature of God and therefore he made animals that way too. But he obviously didn't make all animals that way because he's admitting that some animals do this, but many other animals don't do this at all. Um, I, don't, I don't know, maybe, I'm not saying this is impossible and this isn't, um, this isn't the form of creation and what God's plan was. I just think it's kind of a stretch to just, just have a blanket statement that this is true, right? Without really any textual evidence being provided in this article. The importance of Orca's language reflects God's handiwork. God spoke the universe into existence and chose to communicate with humanity through language. He desired human beings made in his image to communicate as well. He even identified his son, Jesus Christ, as the word. So it shouldn't surprise us to see communication in various degrees throughout creation. Well, I mean, he made us in his image. And in his image, that's, that's something you could claim as part of our images is that kind of communication, being able to communicate also and have religion, be able to think about our creator and respond uh, to a creator. Um, but we also know that animals aren't made that way according to scriptures. Certainly young earth creationists don't believe that. But then here he's saying it shouldn't surprise us that communication in various degrees throughout creation shouldn't be surprised because God made man able to communicate, animals should be able to communicate, and that was what makes them successful. How wonderful to see God's relational nature reflected in this way. Um, when we look closer at the way they communicate and care for one another, those, we'll also see the reminder of his tenderness and love. The, the, the problem with saying that, and I, you know, I can agree in, in many ways with what's being said in these two paragraphs, um, but these animals also are killers, okay, which is not an aspect of what young earth creationists believe are part of their original nature. Um, and uh, yeah, and there's just so many other animals that don't have that kind of communicative system. But uh, well, let's let's leave it there. Maybe you can give me some thoughts on that. Am I am I crazy? 
uh, thinking that, you know, this article is not really written about orcas, right? It's, it's, it's taking one little thing about orcas, and it's sort of like my original plan was I wanted to say something about God's communication and uh, how that's similar to the animal world, and so this is my example. Um, and hasn't really, th I don't think, thought through the implications of what he's saying. Uh, ICR again, Frank Sherwin. Continuous environmental tracking in plants is clearly seen. Once again, it's just like one article after another. Different groups of organisms, we see continuous environmental tracking that, that, that organisms or individuals are sensing their environment and then they have innate internal programs that are responding, that were created uh, in them as response mechanisms and they adapt to the world around them. Uh, rather than through populations being selected by the environment, you know, populations with variation being selected by the environment, and therefore the environment is selecting versions of organisms which then better survive in that environment. Here the organism itself is making it, I don't want to say conscious, but is, it itself is already endowed with the ability to respond and change itself. Um, plant scientists have known for decades that plants aren't just static uh, entities. Half a million more species of plants in the world display incredible design features and complex interactions with other plants. Well, yeah. Through the decades, botanists have found that plant systems are increasingly complex. Yeah, I mean, they're really complex. Although not alive in a biblical sense. Oh, interesting, because this relates to something I said earlier. They're not alive, right? In a biblical sense. You'd have to go to the reference there. I'm not sure which one it is, but I can imagine a couple that, that would fit. They're not flesh all right they're not they don't have the breath of life and so they're not alive and this is right here another explanation for why uh an animal could pick up a plant and eat it all the way down and the roots and everything and it would be dead right it would be gone it wouldn't exist in this world anymore and that could have happened before the fall Right, that could have happened in the original creation. The way God made the world, it was all right for organisms to eat plants and eat them up completely. Now, there is a naive view uh, among young earth creationists, uh, especially followers of young earth creationists, but even old time young earth creationists, who actually made ridiculous arguments. Not not many did this, but I've heard I've heard it that God gave plants to be eaten but they never ate the whole plant, right? They ate the fruit off the plant or like ate some leaves, but that wouldn't have killed the, or the plant. The plant has the ability to rejuvenate itself. And so no plants actually died before the fall. They were all stayed alive. Uh, simply parts of the plants were used as food, just like sloughing cells off of your skin could be eaten by cockroaches. Um, but that wouldn't mean that you had to die for another organism to survive. And so maybe that's the way the pre-flood world worked at that time, uh, is this uh, uh, just using parts of organisms that were in excess, all right? Their abundance uh, was shared among all the other plants. Now, this right here is showing that this is really the current young earth creationist view. Plants aren't alive. If they're not alive, you, you can go ahead and eat them, the whole thing, right? That's not causing death. If you're not alive, you can't die. Um, nonetheless, even though they can't die and they're not part of the living world, they do reveal creative design and organization. All right. I mean, I guess rocks and don't planets reveal design and organization and so forth. So they're, they're just like any other part of the world, the physical world. Um, the, the part of the world that doesn't have is not soulish and has the breath of life, which is something higher, all right, than this other thing. And then humans have the image of God in addition to that flesh or breath of life. Uh, oops, whoopsie, whoopsie, it's giving away the whole, uh, giving away what we got coming up here. Um, this example has been known for decades that plants can defend themselves from predators. Yeah, there's some really cool mechanisms that plants use to defend themselves from predators. And presumably, many of these mechanisms for plants anyway, not for animals, because animals didn't need to defend themselves from predators since they couldn't die, right? But plants, since they could die, sorry, in quotes, die, but not die, couldn't die before the flood, 
they've still would, you know, still God still gave the mechanisms to prevent death. Sorry, not death, prevent not death, prevent being completely, utterly annihilated, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, so they had these amazing adaptations. A recent researcher by plant scientists have discovered sophisticated processes of cellular signaling that helps the plant defend itself and use energy for growth. Great. Um, continuous environmental tracking is clearly seen in how immune and growth responses within a plant are interconnected. I have the quote here, and then it says, in 2020, five evolutionists rightly asked these, how these metabolic pathways could have evolved. How could did such vastly complex metabolic pathway schemes develop? The exact history of this phase of life's evolution is unknown. All right, that, that's a, a proper quote. Um, you know, just lots of things we don't really know. I mean, it was like, yeah, we, we need to study that and investigate that. What I found interesting was that quote is not about the paper that he's talking about. So the, the, Sherwin is referencing a particular paper that goes through the, is describing these intricate uh, responses of plants to defend themselves against predators, like giving off chemicals that then warn other plants so they can begin to make chemicals that then shield themselves from being eaten. And then he kind of throws in this quote about how, like, well, there are these evolutionists who have asked how this could possibly happen. You know, how did these intricate designs, these mechanisms come into being? Um, but that particular paper didn't reference it. And that's what he's saying. It's interesting to note that the article has much to say about highly specialized sensors and molecular biomolecules and communication circuits, which happen to be the components of CET. All right. So it's like, got to throw that in there. Hey, look, there's these intricate designs and engineered principles in these plants and therefore that's that's a component of what we like to talk about continuous environmental tracking they're tracking their environment and responding but the article never mentions natural selection right i love how they throw that in there it's like this article is describing all these things and and look at this they don't even try to use natural selection to explain it so it's it's all engineering and that's what we've been saying We've been saying that everything is really based on engineering principles, and it's as if these scientists who wrote this paper um, are agree with us because they don't even mention, they don't go to the natural selection card to try to explain the origins of these mechanisms. I'll say, I looked at the original article, and I'm like, you're right. I mean, they're not lying. They, they don't talk about natural selection. The paper is also an article written in a journal by people who are not evolutionary biologists and they really are just describing a system and they're not making an attempt they have no attempt to talk about why these different systems exist they're simply explaining and showing how they they work right like tens of thousands of other journal articles out there where you're describing something some biologists when they work on a particular uh, project, they're interested to know why something is the way it is, or maybe doing comparative biology or something like that. Others just want to be able to describe the system because maybe they're going to try to mimic it, right? That's what a lot of engineers do, you know, the biomimicrists, right? They're trying to just describe a system and then they're going to go off and try to like emulate that in our own engineering. That's not a, um, that's not saying that they believe that this is its origins, that it is continuous, that it is made to be engineered, that it is designed to be that way, and that they discuss what design means and how design came about. The, could be the authors have no, they don't care about that, right? They're totally practical. It's a totally pragmatic question, like just what is this? What is this plant doing? What are the chemicals they're making? That's what they're doing. They're describing it. Just because they don't then go on to go through a long discussion and go into all kinds of other issues of origins. And in that particular journal, I suspect that if they did, the editor would be like, our audience doesn't care about that. Chop that out. We just want to know the facts, right? We just want to know like your description of this. I mean, that's some journals are like that, right? They're not trying to publish this in molecular biology and evolution in which they would be addressing the questions of the origins of these particular systems, in which case 
almost certainly they would be talking about natural selection. So the fact that they don't mention natural selection is not a, um, it's not a, um, it's not supporting, you know, ICR. It's simply neutral, right? But ICR, you know, in the way that they write these articles, it's as if here we are, we have, uh, you know, that's evidence of their particular viewpoint that their, their view is right because somebody, it's almost like saying they couldn't explain it with natural selection. That's why they didn't. Nope. That's just not understanding how the scientific literature works and understanding the motives and who the authors are of the paper and their probably utter lack of interest in that particular question. Okay, just a couple other items. Answers in Genesis. Today, Troy Lacey. She writes a short article about it's Church Library Month. And, um, you know, got, uh, I don't know, it's a month for probably 5,000 things, but I, I didn't know. It's Church Library Month. An opportunity to stock your church's library with resources to equip believers. She has a description of how, like, you know, the, it's had that uh, church libraries are waning, but, you know, a lot of people can't afford books. And so this is a way that you can give them uh, resources. And so, you know, not people can't always always buy our books directly. So but we'd like to sell them to churches and then you can borrow them from the church uh, to be able to read it. And so encouraging churches to buy Young Earth Creation material and stock their libraries, right, with Young Earth Creation material. And I know this to be a fact that it does happen a lot. A lot of churches have a large amount of Young Earth Creation material in it. And a lot of times it's not the church buying it. It's individuals who have bought material and then donated it to the church. And they end up with a very large Young Earth Creationist uh, uh, book section. Uh, and I just wanted to show you that um, I was at a a church in um in the in well i was at last june and i was visiting uh friends and i was in the basement of a church for an event and i'm always drawn to the book table always you know one of the ways that i tell sort of what a particular church is like is i look at their book table and i see what the kinds of books that they are they are offering up and honestly there's a lot of really good books, a lot of very good, strong theological um, literature uh, at this particular church. Um, much more so than there would be at your uh, typical uh, non-denominational church. Uh, and so, yes, a whole bunch of really great stuff, including you know, a book by my grandfather and, uh, you know, people I know, right? But then it's always disappointing to go to the other sections of, like, other material, uh, sometimes like, you know, a science faith section or like cultural issues or uh, in this case, interestingly, they had a section, the 290s, uh, which was other religions. And I, I found it kind of interesting that uh, that the Young Earth Creationist material is in the other religions section, along with all the books on uh, cults. <laughs> I was like, I'm pretty sure. The church doesn't mean to call young earth creationism a cult. I don't think they're like putting this literature here, like here you can learn about this cult. Um, you know, see here we've got, uh, uh, you know, here we have cults, <laughs> the chaos of cults. But right next to it, we have um, the Twilight of Evolution by Henry Morris. Uh, we have Evolution in the Modern Christian by Henry Morris. We've got the Answers Book by Ken Ham. We have the Collapse of Evolution by Hughes. Um, we have the Origins, Origin Science by Geisler and Anderson. Uh, the Case for Creation, uh, Evolution or whatever, and uh, Scientific Creation. Uh, that's what would be Henry Morris as well. Um, How Blind is the Watchmaker, right? Uh, but mixed in with all these other with all these other deceptive th these other religions and things that are deceptive. Anyway, I it was kind of, you know, I was kind of disappointed, but kind of uh, I found it a little bit humorous uh, at the same time. You know, and I, I also usually open up the books and I want to see you know if people are reading them. But in in particular, let me just show you this one, highlighted among these books, off on a different shelf, actually on one of the more prominent shelves. Um, that's right up front. Um, I saw this book and I recognized it right away in the beginning compelling evidence for creation and the flood by Walt Brown I've rarely talked about Walt Brown here, but he's a, he was a very popular young earth creationist who have a he has a different model of uh, It's called uh, um, Well, he believes in liquefaction 
and um, and how all the sedimentary layers were um, were deposited sort of all at one time and sorting of uh, differential sorting of the different fossils uh, at that time. But anyway, he's very popular in certain circles, uh, in, in certain denominations. And he was a speaker. He has a certain theology that is attractive to um, some groups of Christians, evangelical, more, more conservative, I'll say theologically conservative Christians. I don't mean like right-wing conservative uh, Christians, like politically. Uh, theologically conservative Christians. And um, so I'm very aware of Walt Brown. I've read his book. I've got, I've got like several different editions of it. This is the eighth edition, by the way, right here. And it was, it was like a brand new book, but it's the eighth edition, which means it's from 2008. Right? And there was a ninth edition just very soon after that. So this book is more than 10 years old. So it's probably 14 years old. All right, and I see it like sitting there prominently, like, wow, you know, you got to check this book out in the beginning. I open it up and I look inside and I see like, here's the, here's the borrow, borrowing card, right? And um, Walt Brown in the beginning and uh, borrow his name, <laughs> not been borrowed. Now, possibly, possibly it's been borrowed so much they had to put a new card in there. But I looked in the other books. All right. And I looked in the other books and they all had the same, like this same color, the same handwriting, the same everything on the cards in those particular books. And a couple of them had like one checkout. Uh, and so whoever made those other ones, which are in really old books as well, older than this book, um, the same person wrote this particular insert, right? The slip. Uh, and so I believe that this slip probably really is 14 years old. And um, and the book hasn't been checked out. I mean, it doesn't mean someone took it off the shelf and didn't take a little look at it, but it probably means nobody has taken it home and like done a thorough read with it. Uh, and that's what I kind of that's the impression I get with uh, young earth creationist material on the bookshelf is, yes, once in a while, there's going to be somebody who's interested. But for the most part, um, the literature is not widely read um, in, in churches. And it's just like looks nice on the bookshelf and it and what it really is is it's it's like a it's uh what do you call that it's a dog whistle or virtue signaling or it 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 is telling um the parishioners of that church all right the people that come to that church it's telling them like this is this is one of our beliefs all right and so i think for the most part if they put this prominently what they're saying is this is one of our one of our identities Right. This is something we identify with. And and because especially since young earth creationism now is identified with and becoming more and more and more identified with sort of Christian nationalism and Christian uh, right wing politics. Um, it's it's sort of a it's a well, I was going to say subtle, but maybe it's not such a subtle way of saying like you're safe here if those are your views, because, look, we have young earth creationist material here. Um, and so that kind of goes along with all those other kinds of uh, conspiracies. Um, yeah, right. So anyway, Walt Brown. Yeah, that was a blast from the past because I really haven't seen him very much. So I was like, oh, wow, look at that. They got Walt Brown like sitting right out there uh, front and center. And, and I when I saw it, I was just like, so disappointed because there are so many good things um, at that church and there's so much good literature. And the, sadly, what, what upsets me about having Young Earth Creationist material sitting right next to good literature is that it's so bad, right? That you're like, well, if you're falling for this bad stuff, that kind of impugns the, the good material. Like if you, if you don't have discernment to be able to know that this is a bunch of crap, right? Walter Brown's book in particular. And that there is just so much bad argument in there. It's not good theologically. It's not good scientifically. And if you don't have the discernment to be able to say this isn't this isn't something we you know that you should read as a serious Christian, then it makes you then begin to question other material. And and I know that other material, and some of it I would highly recommend. Uh, but it gets hard for me to. It would be hard for me to recommend to somebody who. Um, would see it right next to the shelf with a creation science book because they're going to, it's guilt by association, whether that's right or wrong. 
it's it's guilt by association. Um, and that's one of the things that, that bothers me about the churches, you know, especially conservative theological churches sidling up to young earth creationism. It's one thing to say that theologically you're a young earth creationist, but to then say, like, here's how to explain young earth creationism. Like, here's the scientific explanation that supports this view. You don't have to go that far. You, you can say you're theologically, you're, you're bound to a, a what, looked, what you think is a young earth interpretation without sort of sucking all, that, all the bad science up with it. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have, you're going to be asked questions and have to have some explanation, but um, you don't need to to associate with those who theologically really aren't all that in line with you, and but you feel like I don't have anyone else you know with me. That, but you know, theologically conservative folks are the ones that are actually many of them are not young Earth creationists, right? They're theologically conservative, like myself. I'm theologically conservative. Yeah, I would, and I'm not going to go into what all that means right now, but uh, I think of myself as being far more conservative in many, many ways than Ken Ham. Um, and I think that's a lot true for a lot of uh, theologically conservative churches. They would find Ken Ham's um, hermeneutics and his, his understanding of the Bible to be in many ways askew in many, many different ways. Um, so another, I keep saying quick, but then of course I keep talking, but, um, I'm not sure that on this week in creationism, I've met, I've talked about logos research associates, um, but they're a loose affiliation of young earth creationists that have PhDs or some kind of advanced degree. So it's like a society for young earth creationists that are the scientists, um, not so much the theologians on that side it's, and not lay Christians. This is all like a scientific society. Uh, and they have a variety of different projects or initiatives. Uh, and it's, it's also cross, across all of Young Earth Creationism. So there are members from different Young Earth or organizations, apologetics ministries, independent creationists, uh, creationists that work at, at colleges uh, that are professors. Um, and they all have come together. It's not a very active group. And Answers in Genesis is not terribly involved. There's almost nobody from Answers in Genesis that has been active with Logos Research Associates. So by, because they're missing one of the major answer, uh, Christian apologetics groups, it's kind of blunts their ability to have a lot of influence because as far as I can tell, Answers in Genesis doesn't really want to promote anything that comes out of Logos Research Associates to, to any great degree. All right, the only reason I'm bringing them up right now, I told you who they are, but uh, and there's almost nothing ever to talk about them because there's almost nothing new. I mean, the website stays the same for years at a time. Um, but I went there today, and I've been there like a couple weeks ago. Like This is one of the sites I only check every couple weeks. And I went there, and I'm like, whoa, they got a new logo. Like they got this new look, right? So somebody's like thinking about marketing, I guess, you know, it's like, we got to have a fresh look. The text is all the same. I don't see any new information here, but <laughs> the logo is new. Um, so here's Logos Research Associates un, uh, upholding a high view of science and a high view of scripture. Now their high view of science is that we're all, you know, have graduate degrees. Um, and we affirm you know, the authority of scripture in the way that like Ken Ham would talk about. Now look at their logo. I thought I, I, I was drawn to their logo because again, it kind of looks like a DNA molecule. And one of their projects is, is of course a genetic sort of project. Um, and what I caught, what I caught was it's actually turning the right direction. All right. Rather than the, remember the, <laughs> if many of you watch me regularly, you'll know that, that ICR also, got a new logo at the beginning of this year and they came out with a new logo they put it on cups they put it on banners they put it on their website they put it on all their materials and um, it had a, a backwards winding dna molecule all right a left-handed dna molecule and so which you know it's funny they got it wrong whoever you know they got to do the the logo didn't 
know or think about uh, getting the directionality of the DNA molecule correct. And so they caught a lot of flack, of course. I made fun of them. But, you know, to me, it's understandable. I, I, I mean, I'm not like it's not like the worst thing in the world. Um, but they soon changed their their uh, molecule back right, so that the grooves are going the other direction. Um, and so they never, ever really admit. I don't see anywhere they ever admitted it was different. It's just like one day all of a sudden they were all changed. Now, they still have a ton of material. It was, you know, they were still using drinking out of cups uh, on their live show that had the wrong molecule on it, yeah, the wrong direction of the molecule. But what are you going to do? They already spent all that money. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so Logos Research Associates, they come up with something that's DNA-like in their structure, and they got it the right direction. All right, I'm sure that they noticed, and besides there's ICR folks that are involved in Logos Research Associates, so I'm sure when they were discussing their logo, they're like, make sure you get that right. Make sure you get that, that molecule twisting the right direction. And they did. They got it right. Uh, lastly, Ken Ham tweets. Uh, I think those was the tweet. Yeah. Um, Ken Ham tweets about exegesis and eisegesis. And it's just like I knew, you know, what he was going to say when he posted this. It's like um, it, it, he turns everything into it's either this or this. This is truth and this is error. Uh, without a seemingly a clue that in the real world, nothing is ever this black and white. All right. Um, I mean, in Christianity, there are certain things that are black and white. This is not one of those things. Now, the fundamental principle that we should let scriptures speak to us rather than us have an idea and make scriptures say what we want it to say. Totally fine with saying that that's not what we should do. Um, but then to turn around and say that we, like, what does Answers in Genesis do? We do exegesis. We open the scriptures and we allow it to speak to us, right? Our approach is to take Genesis naturally, letting it to speak to us according to the type of literature, context, etc. Context would be like, um, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the cultural, you know, uh, situation at the time and so forth, and understanding what, what, what the authors were meaning to say within that context. That's why we take Genesis, written as historical narrative, as literal history. So what is eisegesis, right? Eisegesis is the, you know, bad Christians use that, right? Because they're all about themselves. They're not about trying to please God and know what God wants of us. They're all about themselves and trying to read into Scripture. All right. They're all narcissists who, who are all about pleasing themselves. Right. They're right. So who are the ones doing eisegesis? Well, by logos, reasons to believe, reasonable faith. And many other Christian organizations, Christian academics, especially uh, Christian professors, you know, especially theologians at seminaries and churches. They take Genesis by taking man's pagan religion of millions of years and other evolutionary beliefs and adding to them the Genesis to compromise God's word. To say that he is not, you know, bringing his own views to scripture uh, is naive. I mean, you have to acknowledge that it's not easy. It's not easy to tell the difference between exegesis and eisegesis, even if one believes that one that exegesis is always the best route and that you should avoid eisegesis. I mean, almost all systematic theologians uh, will talk about that and say that. I mean, even these academics, they understand that there's exegesis and eisegesis, and they'll talk about how exegesis is, is something that we're striving to doing. But they'll also, if Ken Ham reads that, we'll, we'll have long, you know, there's a lot of articles written on how exactly you tell the difference between eisegesis and exegesis as a fallible human being. How do you know when you are importing your ideas versus only listening to the text? Because to listen to the text, you still have to use some fallible processes of understanding language, language analysis, uh, understanding the culture. 
uh, trying to figure out what that original author was in their environment meant to say and was intending to say. You can talk all you want about being literal, but even in being literal, you are importing certain ideas about what it means to be literal, and it's not necessarily biblical. You're importing your own desires of what that what literal should be. Um, the point of all this is, is that Ken Ham makes everything into we're doing something right and everybody else is wrong, when really all these people are really attempting to understand God's truth. And, and many of them are sophisticated enough to understand, all right? By really understanding scriptures and really being involved in trying to, to tease out the meaning of God's word, that separating eisegesis and exegesis is really difficult. And being conscious of where you may be doing eisegesis when you think you're doing exegesis is really important. And Ken Ham doesn't seem to have that kind of awareness. And the fact he is not aware of what he does and what he says in many times means that he is falls into Isis Jesus without realizing it. He thinks he's doing exegesis, but frequently is doing Isis Jesus himself, despite his protestations, protestations against Isis Jesus. And that's the irony of him posting material like this, is that his is his obliviousness to the very difficulty of doing this and the fact that other Christians are more aware and self-aware of their um, their interpretive methods than he is. Okay, that's it for this week. Uh, that's it for this week in creationism. Um, I've already seen some, some fun topics uh, for next week. And I've got on my plate uh, several different, um, uh, more science-related, sort of like strictly science uh, things I'm going to talk about. I'm teaching genetics right now, and so I'm reading a number of papers. And I do a, uh, I do each week a uh, a presentation to my class. It's kind of like like hot topics, like stuff that's right off the press, and like how it relates to the topics. And I'm just going to record some of those, um, and. Um, in some cases, I'll relate them to why they are relevant to the sort of creation evolution debate. But other times they might just strictly be like just the science of it. And uh, you can interpret um, how they might be significant for that. All right. So that's uh, that's it for me this week. Hey, thanks for joining me. I will talk to you later. Bye bye.